Well, welcome everyone. I know it's almost beer o'clock on a Friday, so I'm grateful that you showed up. Um, welcome to the North Pole. I put a little thermometer on the board here to remind you how cold it is. Um, but at least you won't fall asleep, I guess, or, or maybe it'll be hypothermia anyway. Um, so I, uh, my name's Dean Wampler. Uh, I have this pretentious made up title at Lightbend, VP of Fast Data Engineering. Um, Basically, I lead the development team that's uh, building a distribution of streaming technologies on top of uh, DCOS. Uh, you know, Spark, Kafka, Mesos, uh, well, Mesos is underneath, obviously. Uh, Flink, eventually, um, Aka Streams, and so forth. I'll talk a little bit about the pieces in this. You know, I, I know this, you don't want a marketing talk, and that's, when not, this is, uh, that's not what this is about, but I did want to you know, having uh, played with these frameworks for a while in Mesos and actually made the choice of Mesos over alternatives, that's really what this talk's about and what we've learned from that. Uh, I've already, uh, by the way, if you look for the slides on the website, I forgot to check if you could even get them yet, but I uploaded them like an hour ago, so they are up there if you, if you want to get the slides. Uh, and there's some general themes I want to hit on. I'm not going to do this in order, but just some uh, takeaways is... Uh, first, talk a little bit about how applications and application architectures are changing. Uh, you know, wh wh why are they different today versus, say, five years ago, or pick some time frame, and how that's influenced everything else that I'm going to talk about. Uh, you know, why we picked Mesos and some of the particular uh, things about it that have proven really valuable for our needs and for, obviously for our customer needs. And then talk about a few specific insights. Um, it won't be a highly technical talk by any means, uh, but uh, hopefully you'll get uh, some useful stuff out of it. All right, so first, why do we care? Well, I'm leading uh, the team that's developing this uh, product we're calling the Fast Data Platform. It's in beta now and it'll come out this fall. Uh, just two slides about it. Uh, so this is sort of a block diagram of the pieces. Uh, un and, well, I, I, I don't know how useful this actually is. Let me just show you the interesting bits, which is what's on, under the little blocks. Uh, mostly we're going to talk about the sort of uh, middle right top, which is the streaming engines, and then also Kafka and kind of what we've learned from uh, using those. Um, but also, uh, you know, I'll get into a little bit how uh, it turns out we're seeing a lot of need to build microservices that uh, integrate with these other tools, much more so than maybe in a classic Hadoop environment. And then there's other pieces you need like management, monitoring tools, machine learning, and all that. And deployed on DCOS uh, for you know, having a commercially supported Mesos distribution. Uh, the bottom actually, that's sort of a little small to read, is bring your own storage, although we are actually supporting HDFS ourselves in this case. Okay, so enough uh, architecture. Well, the first question that we came up with, uh, say, three years ago, when we really started thinking about what we should do in big data was, well, should we use Hadoop? So let me step back a second and just to provide a little context. So I'd been working in uh, like the Spark, uh, rather the Scala community for a long time, uh, and actually knew everybody at Lightband uh, called TypeSafe at the time when they got started, but I wasn't actually that interested in working on microservices, which has been kind of the focus. Uh, Lightband is the, it was founded by the creator of the Scala programming language and the guy who created Akka. You probably heard about Akka because it's the A in Smack. Um, actually, there was a really good talk I just went to by a couple of guys from Adobe who've been using OpenWhisk, which is the serverless framework that is written in Akka. So you probably, if you had never seen it before, you got a little taste of what Akka is about there. Uh, and I'll briefly talk a little bit about it as we go along. But anyway, so, uh, you know, three or so years ago, it turned out Scala was starting to get very interesting in the big data world because Spark and Kafka are written in Scala. So people started talking to Lightbend about it because they were, it was kind of driving them to use Scala. And then I got involved with Lightbend to think about, well, how do we actually take what we've learned about microservice development and Scala programming and functional programming and apply that to the big data world? Uh, if, if you know anything about me, I have a lot of talks out there on YouTube and Twitter, and I have a few where I rant and rave about how the Hadoop world is screwed up because it's not functional. You know, we don't, we're using crappy languages and all this. Um, but anyway, not to get into too much about that. So fast forward a little bit, and, you know, a couple of years ago when we sort of crystallized this idea of, well, you know, the, the world is kind of moving towards more stream-oriented versus batch-oriented. Not that batch is going away, but people need answers faster. You know, it's the usual thing that time is money. If I can extract value more quickly from data, 
then that's better. So that's been kind of one of the driving forces behind streaming apps. The other one is just the pragmatics of how do I serve mobile? How do I serve, you know, like map applications and all that stuff? You can't do that in batch, right? Uh, well, at least not completely. You might do some data processing offline to have the data ready for you know, real-time serving. But as we started thinking about how to support customers doing stream processing at scale, it became clear that Hadoop just isn't, it wasn't really cut out for it. Um, this is sort of my schematic diagram of a Hadoop cluster. Uh, really, there's only three important pieces here, and that is uh, there's uh, you know, some sort of distributed storage, which is HDFS, the Hadoop file system. You know, there's some sort of compute, which used to be MapReduce, and now it's mostly Spark. And then there's this thing called Yarn, which is yet another resource negotiator that's, that's sort of the analog of Mesos, you know, roughly speaking, that knows what to do when you say, I want to run this job, and the data's over here, and it figures out how to partition that into tasks, which you know, are basically processes, JVM processes, and run them over the cluster over, over all this data. Uh, and then there's a bunch of support stuff that people put in. And if you buy a Hadoop distribution today, you can get some streaming technologies like Storm and Spark and, uh, sorry, I actually meant to say Kafka, Storm and Kafka, uh, Spark Streaming and so forth. But I want to make the case that uh, th that's not really good enough for what we need today. And that's one of the reasons Mesos is much better positioned for this. So, but what's not to like? Well, three things, limitations in Yarn, uh, the sort of batch orientation and this idea of, well, what if I need to write other services and I'm just gonna use microservices, that buzzword, to talk about the other services I might need to write in my environment. Uh, so let's talk about Yarn first. Uh, and I have to be, you know, to be honest uh, to the Hadoop community, a lot of these issues are trying to fix to some level, but you know, it's, it's, it's relatively old software, so it can be difficult to uh, bring it up to um, you know, what's, what we have today in Mesos. Well, uh, Yarn, yet another resource negotiator, was always designed with this idea that you're gonna submit a job to me and I'm gonna partition it based on what resources are available uh, into tasks and I'm gonna run them and they're gonna have some finite duration. Uh, because I'm assuming it's a batch job, that means I kind of know in advance how much data I'm gonna actually be working with, so I kind of know roughly how many tasks to schedule. Why is that important? Well, because in a streaming world, I don't know how much data I'm gonna be processing. You know, Super Bowls happen, uh, but Justin Bieber tweets, you know, these kind of things happen and suddenly you get these big spikes in traffic. Uh, you get network partitions if you run long enough and so forth. So it's not terribly good if, if all I understand is batch jobs. In fact, it's so limited, it can't even run the, the uh, daemons for HDFS like the name node and, um, uh, data node. So in fact, this is kind of a theme. If you're running Kafka, if you're running Storm, if you're running uh, uh, HDFS, you're not really going to be using the sort of Hadoop resource management. Why did that happen? There it goes. Um, you're going to be uh, kind of hardwiring these things a little bit on your own and then only getting the resource negotiation that we're used to, that we really love about Mesos, uh, just when you run your uh, data analysis jobs. Uh, the other thing that's really bad these days is they do now support containers. There is like, in fact, I Googled this right before to make sure that I wasn't lying about this. There is actually additions for container support, but it's way behind what we're used to, like the uh, Open Container Initiative and uh, CNI and those kind of things. And once again, because of that batch orientation, it's kind of ideal for like big fat JVMs that are reading big chunks of file systems, but not so great if I need relatively uh, you know, small jobs for some things, big jobs for others. And so that means that if we don't wanna do batch, if we wanna do streaming, it's a little bit more like we're gonna kinda of roll our own services, we're gonna kinda of, kind of work around the limitations of, of Yarn and uh, do things our, our own way, like running Kafka, Cassandra, and so forth. Now, one of the things I wanna argue as we go along is that increasingly what we see customers doing is they're not only building like, you know, Spark streaming jobs and they're running HDFS, but they're also writing a lot of microservices that interoperate with these things. Um, I'll give you an example just from a lunchtime conversation I had where I might work for a healthcare company 
And even though I'm writing maybe classic data warehousing jobs with Spark, I'm also writing like microservices that embed the rules for like regulatory enforcement of you know, data privacy and um, I don't know all the terms that they use for this stuff, but basically, you know, any, anything I might need to know about, uh, you know, healthcare billing and record management and all that. And I really want those services to be accessible from my streaming jobs so that as, you know, data is coming through, I can properly uh, manage it with these requirements. I'm sorry about the uh, flickering display here. So this kind of work, mixed workload it's not so great when in Hadoop either. It really, Hadoop is kind of focused on, I'm gonna do lots of batch jobs, and if I wanna mix in microservices, you kind of have to sneak them in on the side or, or, or partition your cluster in some way. In fact, uh, if they even say, if you're gonna run Kafka, you want dedicated nodes for Kafka, you don't want them mixed up with your, you know, the rest of Hadoop, right? Okay, so that brings us to why we picked Mesos, and I know some of this is preaching to the choir, so I, don't, I won't belabor these points, but just to sort of catalog them. Well, I was thinking about what, what do I like about Mesos, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna Google, the, I'm just gonna go to the homepage for Mesos for inspiration, and I liked what I saw so much, I just figured I'd do a screen capture. Uh, so this is just uh, Mesos at Apache.org, and I'm only gonna talk about three of these. I, I, you know, I don't wanna go through all of them. But three that I think really are important for the problems that we're facing uh, in streaming and mixed microservice architectures is uh, container support and all of the benefits we get from that for isolation, for running concurrent versions, uh, you know, people who like deploy a, a container and then it, you know, it like runs for a few seconds and then it goes away or they're deploying a service that's gonna run for months and all of that just kind of works. Uh, sort of at a lower level is really actually fine-grained management of my cluster resources so that when I really do need to optimize usage of CPU, GPU, et cetera, I get to do that you know, just for free. It just comes with my ecosystem. Uh, and you know, this list of, of uh, resources that you can manage is, is more than uh, Yarn is capable of today, for example. Like it's, they still haven't gotten GPU resource management done. I had a chat recently with a guy from uh, SkyMine, the company that does deep learning for J. And you know, those, those uh, machine learning guys, especially in the AI world, are all about you know, GPUs now. So if you can't manage your GPU, GPU resources, it's a bad deal. Uh, oh, and this reminds me of something else. I, I can never, I always uh, find this amazing when I think back to the, to the 90s. So I've been around a little while, as you can tell from my platinum blonde hairstyle. But back in the 90s, you know, we would stand up servers and it was a bad deal if the server got more than like 30% utilized, you'd start worrying, right? Like, uh, because that was all your capacity was. Uh, and, and these were like massive sunboxes too, so we only had a few of them. But these days we wanna get much closer to 100% without, you know, falling over for all the reasons of, uh, you know, economy. Uh, and the last one is our, the famous two-level scheduling in Mesos. I, I, I love the simplicity of the Mesos scheduler model that they've actually partitioned the notion of what scheduling means uh, in sort of this tandem dance between the framework itself, um, well, I used the wrong word, between Mesos itself and your application, which is a framework, meaning that Mesos does not have to know everything there is to know about how to schedule a Spark job. Instead, it, it, you know, it offers resources to Spark, and then Spark has the knowledge inside to know what resources it needs to take to do whatever it is it wants to do. So if I want to add my own custom database or whatever, then I can write the scheduler that knows how to, how to accept resource offers, and Mesos remains uh, relatively ignorant about what it is I'm going to do with those resources. That's the opposite of the way Yarn works, where they've actually hard-coded information in, in Yarn about you know, what it means to be a, a Spark job or whatever. And um, you know, that has some advantages, but the disadvantage is that Spark doesn't, oh, sorry, uh, you know, Hadoop doesn't have the flexibility to run other weird things like file systems and databases. So it's those things that lets us do crazy stuff like add these new frameworks and then have them work in a fairly optimal way. So th this is just a diagram of how Spark actually works. When you submit your job, the scheduler talks to the Mesos master and you know, this dance goes on about allocating resources on different nodes uh, under the aegis of a Mesos executor and inside is a, um, a Spark executor. I just said that, pronounced that word differently for no, no good reason. 
and uh, inside that will be the tasks that actually you know, run your job. So uh, here's a little story. I don't know if everybody knows this, but maybe you do. If you read the original Mesos research paper that uh, Ben wrote, there's this hilarious paragraph in there where he says, in order to prove our ideas about two-level scheduling, we invented this little framework called Spark uh, to actually test it. So yeah, I figured most of you had heard that story before. But um, obviously, Spark took off on its own. All right, let's dive into streaming a, a little bit more specifically then. So what are some of the characteristics at a high level that streaming systems have to support? One is, uh, well, I'm going to go into these in detail, but continuous processing, variable lifespans of these streaming jobs, resiliency, and scalability. So what, what's the deal here? Well, continuous processing in a stream, you know, the, the, hopefully the input is never going to stop coming. And if it, it does stop coming, it probably means that you went out of business or something. And similarly, you're going to have to keep feeding output to downstream consumers, storage, whatever. And one of the implications of that is that you need your uh, framework to really scale dynamically on demand, like for those Super Bowl events or Justin Bieber tweets or whatever. Uh, I'm going to come back to this one in a little bit in just a minute. Uh, the other one, though, that I think is kind of a cool thing in terms of optimization are tools like the um, container network interface that let you fine tune how the, your, your uh, container networking works so that you can optimize transport between various uh, components. So you really could fine tune, um, you know, if you've got this high bandwidth stream coming in, you could actually, uh, you know, fine tune how that is uh, configured in the cluster and maybe take resources away from other things. So stuff like that, I think, is going to further help us optimize uh, how we use our clusters. Uh, variable lifespan. So you know, normally a stream is going to run for weeks to months. This is, an, this is a big contrast with a batch job, which you know, might run for hours, maybe overnight. But there's only so much optimization you have to do or, or dynamism you need if, you, if you're going to be done in a few hours. But if this thing is going to have to stand up and be resilient for, for weeks or months, maybe, then it's a, it's a new ball game. Um, and, you know, of course, now, why would you, you wouldn't necessarily have a streaming job that only lasts for a few minutes or a few hours normally, because, as I just said, you know, this is data that's supposed to never stop coming. But in fact, um, and this is something Jay Kreps from Confluent likes to harp on a lot, if you have a stream processing system, then you can treat batch as just a finite stream. In principle. So I could take my batch stream processor if I realized I made a mistake in a calculation and I, but I only want to rerun yesterday's data then I can just start up a stream job that's actually going to have a finite stream which is yesterday's data and I basically have one system that does it all in principle. So that's why I'd still put you know minutes on here. And of course, Mesos is really good at uh, managing uh, very short-lived containers because it's fairly lightweight. I mean, you wouldn't do seconds necessarily because there is some overhead with uh, resource negotiation and, and offer management, but you could do minutes without too much uh, uh, pain. And if you're actually running services or, that are gonna last for you know, ever, like the daemons that run HDFS, the name node and so forth, that, that just works. So coming back to this uh, scalability, resilience and scalability, or the, whether those last two high-level bullets, um, you just get a lot of stuff for free that's been really useful, like you know, a federation through Zookeeper. Uh, actually, in the open WIST talk, there was discussion of not using Zookeeper, but using ACA clustering instead for federation within WISC, uh, the way they had uh, uh, modified it. But there's a lot of fault tolerant facilities, like if you've submitted through a marathon, you can have the job uh, you know, restarted if it fails. But there is one po important point that I'll come back to kind of at the end, and that is if you're building stateful streaming services, then you have to have some mechanism for uh, checkpointing the state so that if it goes down, you can bring it back up where it was. Um, in fact, there's, it turns out there's, a, there's kind of a bad bug in Spark streaming. The, the older Spark streaming versus the new structured streaming, if you know that distinction. The older Spark streaming could successfully start up again with a checkpoint, but there's some particular kinds of data that actually gets lost. Uh, basically, the, uh, the, they have this notion of counters that you can build in. Those actually get reset to zero, it turns out, in Spark streaming if you restart. The reason I'm mentioning this is because I've been uh, dealing with a customer issue the last few days on that particular point. So, um, but the, apparently the new structured streaming is much better at handling stuff like that. So th this is a mechanism that you end up having to solve some way yourself or the tool that you're using like Spark has to handle it for you. 
And then the scalability, the fact that you, you, it's not that hard actually, but this is something that you have to build into your, uh, your streaming system to actually do dynamic scaling up and down. And we've got all kinds of facilities in Mesos now to support this, like you know, optimistic offers and dynamic uh, resource allocation that lets us do this kind of stuff as long as it's built, as, as long as your framework takes advantage of this. Um, uh, we've actually worked with uh, Mesosphere for Spark, for example, to support these kind of newer capabilities so that Spark jobs can be more dynamic, you know, to scale and demand. There's still actually work to do, though, I have to be honest. Okay, so that's kind of the high-level picture of the sort of things you have to worry about with uh, streaming apps in general. I, I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about some particulars that, of, of some of the streaming engines that we've used. So. Uh, we actually focus on four in this fast data platform, and we picked these four because they, we felt that they covered, you know, a reasonable percentage of the kind of the hundred percent of things you might need to do. Um, it, but it kind of sucks that you have four. I'd rather have like one or maybe two, but kind of that's where the world we live in is that uh, if you really want to cover everything, you kind of need to be able to pick from a list of four, in our opinion. And some other criteria that we use that I won't get into in a lot of detail here are pragmatic things like, are these actually viable projects? It turns, somebody wrote this great blog post a couple of years ago listing like 11 or 12 Apache projects that claim to be streaming engines. So, you know, it's right, you have this paradox of, po of choice problem. It's sort of like going into Best Buy to buy a refrigerator and you see this line that goes down, you know, a football field of refrigerators. So you kind of walk out of there because you're afraid to buy the wrong refrigerator. <laughs> so I, I don't really like giving people too many choices because of that problem, but um, what, what I've tried to do is distill it down to four that cover the spectrum and then I'll talk briefly about how each one works uh, for particular kinds of problems and then discuss how they fit into Mesos and how Mesos supports them. So, but to go over these sort of characteristics that you might use, so, so now I'm at the level of I'm gonna write an application and I need to figure out which of these engines I wanna pick. So the first thing you might ask is what's my latency budget? Uh, this is actually pretty important because if you're gonna do things like authorized credit cards, it, the sort of the rule of thumb that I've heard in the banking world is if, if for usability reasons I have 200 milliseconds to like refresh a web page. You know, you've heard that number probably. It turns out of the, all the things that have to happen between me clicking buy and getting a response, the bank gets about 10 milliseconds to make a decision with your credit card you know, purchase. That is way too short for something like Spark Streaming, which is still mostly kind of a mini batch model where it likes to get data in chunks and then use the efficiency of the cluster to process in mass. But for something like Akka or Kafka Streams or one of those, you could reasonably do 10 millisecond individual processing of events, you know, complex event processing. Sorry about that again. Volume is also important. So some of the engines I'll talk about really don't scale horizontally. So they, they're, they're really great at low latency maybe, but if you need to do a lot of stuff like process the Twitter fire hose, uh, maybe I'll just hold this thing. I think this is a bit of an old Mac and it might be the uh, connector. Oh, it does? Okay, all right. Well, I won't touch it then. Maybe that's, that'd be better. Um, but volume. So if you are processing the Twitter fire hose and something like Spark or Flink is really great because they can partition that stream as it's coming in and then do things in parallel. But uh, you know, if you don't have quite that scale but you need lower latency, then maybe another tool is better. What kind of processing are you gonna do? It seems like everybody is layering SQL on top of their streaming engine. You may know that Kafka, the, the Confluent guys just announced this at Kafka Summit like a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, if you wanna do machine learning, and here there's a really interesting problem in machine learning in a streaming context, and that is I'd kinda like to be training models incrementally because you know, let's just say spam is actually evolving more quickly than it really is. I'd like to be uh, adjusting my spam filters to the evolving threat. And there's this notion of concept drift in machine learning where my model is getting stale over time. Um, I had a, the, one of my, the best managers I ever had used to say that software has a half-life. You know, whether you're touching it or not, it's kind of decaying. Or maybe because it's growing irrelevant or something. And I think that's true in machine learning. So, but back to the point, we, We'd like to be able to train models, but also serve them with lower latency than, than we can possibly train them. So that kind of forces sometimes a choice between uh, 
Maybe I'll train with Spark because it's pretty good at that kind of batch, or, you know, mini batch stuff like I might do maybe every hour I'm gonna update my models. But then how do I take that model and actually serve it from my low latency stream engine that may not be Spark? So there's some interesting problems there. Uh, and if I'm just doing simple filtering and transformations, you know, like for say ETL kind of problems, extract, transform, and load, then, then I have a lot more options. And some things are gonna be better than others for other reasons. All right, moving on to the third uh, page of these uh, trade-offs. Um, this goes back to that thing I mentioned a minute ago where uh, I might actually need to look at each event individually, like authorizing a credit card, doing like fraud detection, that kind of stuff. Or maybe I'm just doing bulk processing where everything is coming in, each of these records is actually kind of anonymous. I just want to clean it up, uh, maybe join it with some other sideband data and then spew it out to its downstream consumers. I don't need to process it individually. I could kind of actually exploit the efficiency of doing things sort of in groups. And then the last one is what kind of interoperability do I need to other tools? So actually the reason this point is here is because it turns out Kafka Streams is uh, uh, really designed to read and write Kafka topics and it does that very, very well. But if you wanted to have it process like RESTful, you know, be a hook for RESTful input, then you'd have to use something else along with it. So, but other tools have a lot more flexibility in terms of just direct connection to this, that, and the other thing, like writing to databases. So let's talk about these uh, four tools that I've sort of already mentioned and how they fit into this picture and then what Mesos does for us to make them you know, really good tools to work with. Uh, and I'm, they're actually fall into two groups. There's Kafka Streams and Aka Streams have a lot of synergies and various ways they'll get into and then Flink and Spark kind of fit into their own little subgroup. So if I'm gonna do Kafka Streams, this again is the library that sits on top of Kafka, and actually to be more precise, so this is actually important, you write an application that embeds Kafka Streams as a library. And so you manage your application, your microservice, whatever, any way you want. Uh, the exception to that, it turns out if you do use this Kafka, uh, Kafka SQL, KSQL library that sits on top of Kafka Streams, there are some services that you do run in that case. But anyway, it's, it can be pretty low latency. Uh, latency here is actually more limited by how long you let your queues get, uh, your topic length become in Kafka. That's gonna be your kind of latency budget in, in Kafka streams. Uh, it's not designed for, it, you know, it's not a tool you use to shard this massive pipe of data across a cluster into partitions so you can run in parallel. It's not really designed for that. It's more like medium volume, which I don't wanna say low volume because that sounds bad, but you know, not volumes like Spark can do. It's fantastic, it has a lot of really good primitives written in to make a lot of common problems easy to do like extract, transform, and load transformation kind of stuff where I'm just gonna, my favorite example of this is that maybe I'm ingesting raw log data and I wanna parse it into some sort of record format, write it to a new Kafka topic and then downstream consumers aren't parsing strings, they're actually reading records that represent the log data. But they also have some cool table abstractions. So if I just need to do aggregations, I don't actually need to see every record. I wanna see like the average over the last minute or something. They, they have some nice facilities for that. Uh, and so you can sort of, if you think about how, what that means in terms of individual record process, and I kind of wrote this last bullet backwards uh, in a way, uh, ETL would be like looking at each event one at a time, whereas the table abstraction would be more like I'm doing sort of a data flow that's doing aggregations, sort of, anyway. Now, Aka Streams is, so again, we're talking about the Smack Stack A uh, placeholder. Aka Streams is actually a, a, a DSL, domain-specific language on top of Aka actors. So rather than having to write low-level actor primitives, you can write things as data flows and then it will materialize actors for you. It also is a library that you embed in your applications, so it's sort of analogous to Kafka streams in that way. It can be very low latency, so even though there is a bit of overhead sending messages between Aka actors, it's pretty good down into the millisecondish range. I mean, so you wouldn't use it for like controlling uh, SpaceX rockets when they're landing, but uh, it's pretty good for uh, things like fraud detection, credit card authorization, and stuff like that. Again, sort of medium volume, not designed to partition your data. 
uh, it actually, of all these tools, it has the most sophistication in terms of the kind of event flows you can define. It's the only one of these, for example, that lets you do like feedback loops, although I really have no idea what that would look like. I'm not sure I would try it, but you could do feedback loops if you wanted, uh, and so forth. And it, it's, uh, Akka is kind of famous for doing this so-called complex event processing like you know, fraud detection or credit card authorization and so forth. So this is, I drew this diagram like maybe two hours ago, so it's not very good, but it's sort of the idea of what you might, what I mean by um, uh, how you might embed Akka or Kafka streams into an application that's, uh, or, and actually the application here is represented as microservices that you'd be running that are all processing a stream of events. Uh, the thing about this really, the reason this slide mostly is here is to talk about how this is supported in Mesos. And once again, because we have really good support for containers, for you know, lightweight containers as well as you know, fairly big things, it's pretty easy to have that event stream coming out of Kafka, uh, whether it's Akka or uh, Kafka Streams. And then I've got these microservices that are reading the, the, the data. Maybe, uh, and really this, this diagram is better uh, for, for Akka because it implies that I'm gonna route this over to other microservices and do manipulations of some kind depending on what the events are. And I'm not really showing output, but you would imagine that maybe it goes back to a Kafka topic or a black screen or something like that. Now the other two that sort of fit into a different category, Spark and Flink are, are actually deployed as uh, systems that are running their own services and then you submit jobs to them that they figure out how to partition and to work over the cluster. And that's really actually even true for streaming, it's true for queries, uh, et cetera. Okay. So, Medium latency though, because at least uh, as of today, and this is sort of going away over time, Spark actually is doing mini batches behind the scenes. So when you say, I wanna run a stream job, uh, it's actually going to, to box up some amount of data and then do some processing over it. So there's some latency there. In, in the old Spark streaming API, the latency was maybe 200 to 500 milliseconds as a minimum. So that, like that credit card authorization example, no way, you can, can you use Spark Streaming for that because you don't have 200 milliseconds to wait. But it is great if you're training machine learning models and you don't mind like having minutes or whatever windows where you just accumulate data, then you know, like do an incremental training of the model and then do something with the data downstream. They will eventually get rid of this uh, minimum latency and make it more of a true streaming engine. That's work that's actively being done, but this is kind of the state of the art today. Uh, I really love the SQL support in Spark. It's now ANSI like 2002 compatible, so it's kind of impressive. Um, and then of course, if you've written your logic for Spark streaming, you can use it for batch mode processing too. So a lot of your offline warehousing apps can be done this way. But it isn't designed for single event processing. That's what I mean by on mass processing, more like you know, just chunks. Uh, so the Flink is the fourth one. And a year ago, I wouldn't have included Flink here, but I really decided that there were two important reasons why I wanted to have Flink in, in, as part of our product. One is that it is designed as one of these high volume tools, but it was designed initially as a streaming engine from the get go, so it does actually do low latency really well. So if you need to do like this partitioning of data but still have reasonably low latency, then Flink is often picked by teams over Spark for that reason. It's really more of a true streaming engine from the get-go. The, the other reason is that there is this Apache project called Beam, B-E-A-M, that's Google data flows uh, sort of top side. And the, the reason I put it that way is Google did something rather clever. They open sourced the data flow definition part of, of data flow. I'm overloading terms a little bit, I know. But not the runner part. The thing would actually materialize that data flow and run it. So if you're in Google Cloud, you get data flow and you can run it that way. But if you're not, you need something else to run it. And as of today, at least, Apache um, Flink is the best tool for running Beam data flows. And what that means, why is that important? Well, Beam to me is like the small talk of our era. Uh, I'm really dating myself here, but small talk was like the, the programming language that everyone aspired to you know, back in the 80s. Uh, okay, yeah, I know the 80s actually existed for most of you. It's just a, you know, 
this thing that people, the people my age claim actually existed. But, but the thing was, nobody actually used small talk, but they all talked about it as like the gold standard. Well, I, I feel that Beam uh, might sort of fall into the same category. It's influencing everything that everybody else is doing. Uh, the reason being that they're, they've done a really good job thinking about all the weird things that happen when you're processing data and you want actual accuracy, not approximate numbers. So for example, suppose that you want to, uh, for your accounting purposes, you need to know like, let's say for every 10 minutes, how many units of a particular you know, SKU did I sell in my stores you know, around the country? You know, I work for a physical retailer, let's say. Well, that sounds like not too bad. I'll just set up this sort of uh, batch or mini batch job or something in streaming that looks at 10 minute windows and then it just does these roll ups and bang, right into the accounting system. Well, not so fast. Unfortunately, because uh, light has a finite speed, chances are pretty high that most of those, uh, or at least a lot of those numbers are actually gonna show up later just because of the time it takes data to trans traverse the network. But even worse, if I get a network partition and data doesn't show up for maybe 10 minutes or an hour, you know, how do I handle this late arrival of data? Do I decide, all right, I'll do some approximate provisional calculations and send those down, but I have this mechanism for sending corrections if I get data arriving late. These are the kind of questions you end up asking yourself if you want to build something that doesn't just do approximate aggregations over Windows, but tries to actually be, you know, sort of really, really accurate. Like the kind of stuff you'd want in an accounting system. So Google's thought about all of this. The Beam does a really sophisticated job of presenting this. And that's why um, I really like Flink because they're ahead of everybody else in terms of supporting these semantics if you need that kind of capability. Okay, I'm running out of time, so let me just quickly finish. I showed this diagram before, but just to emphasize, both Spark and Flink, they run services in the cluster, you submit jobs, and then they figure out how to partition it into tasks, as opposed to embedding these tools in your applications. The last point I wanna get into uh, a little bit that I've alluded to is the sort of merging of architectures that's kind of happening. So if you go back a few years ago, the, there was the big data people who mostly worried about data availability and you know, scaling to big data sets, but didn't worry too much about you know, high availability, high resilience, scalability, those kind of things. It wasn't as big a problem for them as it was for the guys building the web servers uh, in, in the, your organization, which I just lumped under services. But I think today as we've move to microservices and fast data, they're kind of converging a little bit. And let me just quickly make the case and then I'll quit. So if you think about like a classic microsystems architecture, it's usually, I've got each little microservice does its own thing, has a one responsibility. I can evolve them independently. I can, you know, scale them independently. I can drop in new ones. And this fits the Mesos model really well because Mesos supports containers really well. And I can easily, you know, deploy multiple things and, and, and do this kind of stuff pretty nicely. That may not seem to represent what's going on in streaming very much, but actually I think most of the time people are building very similar things in streaming architectures. I've got, whether I've got Spark or Aka Streams or whatever, I'm usually writing an app that does one thing, I'm gonna deploy it, I may need to deploy a lot of them, I may need concurrent versions, so I have a lot of the same concerns. Uh, and I'll just skip past this, the synergy stuff, just to get to the point. But um, I think what's actually happening is that it's kind of forcing these architectures to look more alike than different. If I'm a microservice person uh, and I'm used to building, I was building three tier apps, now I'm building microservices. Well, if I'm successful, then my data is gonna become dominant as my business grows. And so now I'm gonna be worried about building more like stream data processing. You know, if you think about what the Twitter architecture must have looked like from 2007-ish or eight to today, I and mean, that's sort of the evolution that they went through. Conversely, if I'm now going from Hadoop to streaming architectures, now I have to learn how to write services that will live for months and resi you know, resist network partitions and stuff. Okay, the last thing is one thing I think we need to still solve, I'd love to see this solved sort of generically in the Mesos world is like common mechanisms other than maybe Zookeeper where I could have stateful apps that can persist state in a globally available way so that if some of those processes go down, I can easily reconstitute them and not lose where I was. And right now, like I said, everybody, Spark, Flink, et cetera, they all do it their own way or they don't do it at all. Okay, that's it. You know, any questions? Like, where's the beer? Yeah. So 
spark because it's a trend, or is it just because the technology you would rather go clean and be? So I'll repeat the question for the video. Uh, if Flink is so much better at kind of the low latency stuff and the kind of sophisticated semantics, why would I use Spark? I, I think it's a couple of things. One is I, I st still think Spark is probably your better choice for a lot of, if you still need to do a lot of batch stuff. And if you have an organization that's already bet on Spark, like maybe you have a, a established Hadoop cluster, a Hadoop organization that's using Spark, then it would make sense to use it. And not everybody needs those semantics that I described you know, briefly with Flink. Yeah, so I don't think anybody's gonna use all four of these unless you're a really big organization where you're one of those places that uses everything in the world. But um, that, I think that's one of the challenges is people are gonna see a lot of overlap in some of these tools and just kind of make an arbitrary or semi-arbitrary choice between them and maybe have two. Like, I'll use Kafka streams and Flink, or I'll use Aka streams and Spark, and, but I won't use more than that. It's kind of, yeah. Uh, I know you said you're only going to do four, but are you familiar with SAMHSA, and how would, it, how would it get categorized? Yeah, so the question is, what about SAMHSA? And there's some others you could throw in that I've heard about, or people ask about, like Apex, Apache Apex. And I think, um, I think SAMHSA and STORM kind of fall into the same category, for example, of tools that kind of uh, sort of were, were uh, pioneers in this space, but have, have kind of suffered a little bit from, oh, we kind of did that wrong, we kind of did this wrong, and now maybe we need to start over and you know, build the next generation. So I think that they both kind of suffer from that a little bit. Although if you're a STORM user, you should really look at Twitter Heron, which is like their complete rewrite of STORM. Uh, I, I can't say I've actually used SAMHSA, but I think in general from what I've seen of it, it sort of falls into that camp of this was a really good first generation, but we probably need to move on to a second generation technology. Maybe time for one more. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>